Hi, my name is Emily Hillenbrand. I'm with Care USA. My colleague, Chris Matti. Um, and just before we begin, I would just preface this by saying that we're moving within care towards a more academic grounding in social norms theory. Uh, so when we developed this program, I didn't really have these <coughs> concepts in mind, um, but it seems like our programming approach um, is quite closely aligned to what you all have said. Um, so in this presentation, we'll focus on really how we've programmed around um, moving towards behavior change to address some of these deep-seated uh, gender norms and beliefs. So how do we actually program for changes in practices as well as beliefs? Um, in the agriculture sector. So anyone who works in this sector is very familiar with the FAO State of Food and Agriculture Report that outlines these disparities and disadvantages that women face in the agriculture sector in terms of access to resources, extension, um, unfair time burdens um, with, with care work that's disproportionately carried out by women. Um, and you know that the cumulative effect of these uh, gender biases in the sector leads to a productivity gap. Um, and the statement that we hear over and over again is if women simply had the same access to men uh, as men to the productive resources, we could really boost productivity and output and contribute to food security uh, globally. Um, but what we also know is that underneath all of these suboptimal sub agriculture practices and marketing behaviors are these underlying gender beliefs about really um, the place of women in society. Um, these common beliefs that we just heard, um, these, these are some baseline qualitative data from our multi-country um, gender and agriculture program, very similar to what you just talked about. Um, and it really comes down to this idea that are underneath men uh, fundamentally in society. But in our programming, we always begin with a gender analysis, and we um, do try to engage our staff and program participants as much as possible in that. Um, even though they are not uh, necessarily researchers themselves, it does really contribute to their own transformation and understanding of the issues um, in, and understanding kind of how to address uh, gender inequality. So the types of questions that we would ask in the gender analysis are similar to what you just described in, in your approach. Um, what is the ideal man, the ideal woman, but also who, what is the range of behaviors around some of these key areas of, of um, these core areas of inquiry around gender? Who are the exceptions to the norm? What do people think about those people? Um, who is doing things differently? What are the consequences for those people? In what circumstances is it okay for people to um, challenge these norms? Um, what happens to people who don't follow those, those rules? Um, and we also do an exercise that's um, a historical timeline as well to look at what changes have been happening around women's roles and perception of um, gender equality in the communities. Uh, and what are people's perceptions about those changes? What changes do they perceive as positive, and what changes do they see as a threat uh, culturally, and who perceives them differently? And you see different demographic responses, of course, to um, whether these changes are perceived as positive or negative. But often what, you've, what we have found is that um, generally um, there's a perception that gender equality is often associated with development and economic development more broadly. So there is kind of general um, receptiveness towards this idea of, of gender equality as being part and parcel of, of development. Um, but also it helps you to find out what the limitation is and where is the boundary. Um, for example, um, in a gender analysis in Mali, we went to one of the um, communities where men had been very actively engaged. The community leaders were very much supporting women's economic um, development um, and land access, but they told us right uh, up front, we know you're gonna come here talking about um, FGM, and we just want you to know right now that's something that's non-negotiable. Every woman in this community is uh, circumcised. So that kind of just gives you an idea of where the boundaries are and who is, um, who are the, where are the community uh, leaders' opinions on this, and yet who is kind of pushing um, the boundaries of change. So this is uh, the theory of change for our agriculture programming, um, and we've kind of lumped social norms there under change lever five, the enabling environment. 
um, and this is where we would work with our community leaders, our men and boys around um, addressing these specific um, gender attitudes and beliefs that really underlie all of the disadvantages in these key change levers around um, capacity to women's access to extension, um, to knowledge, their ability to access trainings and so on. Um, what are the social norms around women's access to markets and those relationships that they go out um, to negotiate directly with a market actor? What are the rumors about her fidelity, for example, um, and all of the, the norms that underlie lower productivity, decision making around agriculture? And we directly intervene at this intra-household <coughs> level, um, that relationship within the household and try to influence women's decision-making power and communication within that, that household so that women can have greater say over um, agriculture um, and broader decisions as well. So some of the key tools that we use for social transformation and behavior change around gender is beginning with that um, old-fashioned consciousness raising component um, initially with our own staff and it's mandatory within care to have a um, gender equity and diversity training um, and it, it practices like engaging the staff in the process of gender analysis or in the qualitative midterm review is crucial to their understanding of um, why the gender piece fits into the, the agriculture or economic development program and that's that's key to um, getting them on board and, and for them to be able to facilitate some of the, the transformative work <coughs> Um, what we call gender dialogues is one of our key tools for transformation and anyone who was in our day one session on the farmer field and business school approach got an example of some of these um, dialogues. It's a kind of frarian approach um, that uses participatory activities to help people look at everyday practices and taken for granted um, behaviors from a different perspective and to question. Um, is this fair? Why do we do this? Um, who, do, who benefits from this practice? Who's harmed by it? And if it's something that's harmful, how might we want to change it? And so we orient each one of these activities toward an action point. So if what is one specific concrete action that each of the participants would take from this dialogue? If it's, whether it's just talking to a spouse or a neighbor about what they've done um, or um, volunteering to fetch water when they get home and so on. Uh, we also work with male role models um, who are some of these more positive deviants, I guess you would call them. Um, people who are more interested in the gender activities and, and show an, an interest and engagement um, and willingness to demonstrate some of these practices in public in particular. Um, we like to use these field days or cooking demonstrations that are kind of safe spaces for men and women to demonstrate a non-typical behavior. Um, having men and women cook together in public, for example, um, or women um, in the field days demonstrating um, what they've um, learned and, and produced on their demonstration farms as a way of kind of role reversal in a public way. Um, it just allows people to see um, different behaviors and practices in public. Um, and we work to put women directly um, into situations where they can build relationships with uh, market actors that they might not ordinarily relate with. Um, and we work um, at the communication between couples. We have dialogues that are just about communication skills, which do seem to have a really important um, initial um, effect at just getting people to listen to one another. And um, that seems to... Um, be an important starting point for generating more respect. Um, we, uh, from our programmatic experience, have really no doubt that these dialogues are effective. We do see people talking about them. We do see behaviors starting to change. Uh, but our question is, to what extent is this? Are these behaviors changing? Um, I think initially people saw a lot of change around, for example, men's uh, support with workload sharing were kind of ready to pat themselves on the back and be done and, fig and assume that you know we've transformed these roles. Um, so what we wanted to help um, our teams and ourselves to understand is, is what is the significance of some of these changes? Where do they fit in, in this spectrum from small 
early changes to the more transformative changes toward gender equality um, that are actually challenging patriarchy and some of these underlying norms. So um, we drew from a methodology that's called outcome mapping to try to def define and identify in different contexts what are the specific actions and behaviors for men and for women that demonstrate that people are moving toward um, this vision, this shared vision that we developed as a team of, of gender equality, recognizing that some people are going to be already near the top and some people um, might never get there, but recognizing that it is a progression and that we can encourage progress um, toward the more transformative behaviors um, and applaud and recognize early changes while still encouraging um, movement towards a more gender equal. <coughs> so I'm going to hand over to Bernati to explain how we got there. Has come to this point. So what we did in, in our programming in 2014, um, we did a midterm evaluation of our uh, program, which was completely a qualitative one. And uh, for this midterm evaluation, we used this um, uh, uh, outcome mapping as our methodology. Um, uh, using that outcome mapping a methodology helps uh, helped us to actually identify those behaviors, those um, uh, behaviors around uh, uh, gender norms, uh, and put put those behaviors uh, on a, a progressive ma uh, map, uh, which is more you know uh, starting with the uh, behaviors that that one can expect to see or that those which are already happening in, within the community. Um, starting from there to going upward, which are more of um, uh, more, more transformative. So we put those um, things uh, or, or behaviors that you, who, which you could uh, see when you are entering uh, a community at the bottom of the um, mountain uh, or bottom of the hill, saying that these are the expected to see behaviors or which are easy to adopt by the community members. Um, and those which are more progressive or more gender transformative, uh, we put those at the, um, uh, at the top of the mountain and we call those as um, love to see uh, categories. So uh, that gives us a very uh, progressive map um, to see things happening, uh, those observable behaviors, as well as it also helps us to monitor those behaviors. Uh, we uh, put uh, uh, we we uh, put those uh, behaviors. Those we start, start with the community and identify those behaviors um, uh, in a participatory method, uh, which was recognized by the community themselves, not not, not just we as a program team. We put those behaviors into five different categories because we work in um, uh, six different countries and we need to uh, at, a, at the global level. Uh, we need to see what is the trend, what's changing, which are the, which are the uh, areas that we are having more progress with. So we put those uh, indicators or, or behaviors into five different categories for, uh, and we define those categories, what that category actually mean for us. We define each of those categories and these uh, categories are slightly different for men and women. So for example, if you see in category number three here for women, we see the control of income and, product, uh, and, and productive resources and assets. Um, similarly, we also define these categories for men. Uh, if we go to men, we have uh, in category, same category three, uh, sharing control. So for, for women, it is having control, and for men, it is sharing that control because I already have it with them. Uh, and coming to the category four, uh, for women, it was a self-confidence, autonomy, and leadership, whereas for men, it is, um, you know, uh, role modeling, role modeling and respecting uh, women's, uh, women's rights and uh, their values. So those are some of the uh, um, areas that we uh, identified that we should be monitoring. Uh, and once we have had that, uh, those areas, and defined what we exactly mean by those uh, 
uh, categories or domains, we uh, put those uh, behaviors, which we call as, uh, which became our indicators actually, into those uh, categories, and again in that uh, progressive map that we call as uh, expect to see, like to see, and love to see. So that gave us that uh, um, you know uh, way forward to go, and uh, also that those categories. And thus we have, uh, and the, uh, the, these indicators are very very country specific and uh, our um, actor specific. We have uh, uh, indicators of behaviors identified for, for example, this is for Malawi for women. Uh, similarly, we have uh, for men, uh, the indica different indicators in those categories. So giving an example of uh, one of the, uh, we call those as progress markers, each behavior. So for example, women dressing nicely and looking smart. So this was one of the categories, uh, uh, this falls within the category of uh, uh, category four, and these are the things we are observing in the, within the community. It's not that women themselves saying that we, we are, uh, you know, uh, being in the group helps us to, uh, uh, you know, helps us to um, the smarter. It is a leaders also, we also hear from leaders that this, these things are uh, happening. Uh, uh, similarly, we also have uh, uh, behaviors identified for men. This is an example from uh, from India. Um, going to the next slide, please. Uh, this is another example of category uh, number five, which is intimacy and harmony, uh, harmony in the uh, in, in the relationship. So we find um, uh, people saying that what are the changes happening? What are the what are the changes you can observe? within the community uh, that are already happening. So this is one of the examples. Uh, what we did is, it's not just, we just we just don't take the anecdotes, we also quantify the, the, the behaviors that we are, the changes that we are seeing within the community. So this tool helps us to quantify uh, those behaviors which we can observe over a period of time and uh, we can develop a very visual uh, uh, representation of that data, where things are happening, where we are having more progress, where we are struggling even more, uh, so that field staff can, can uh, have their own uh, plan of action to move forward that. We not only uh, identify the status, what we are, what, how it is looking, but what are those enabling factors? which is actually helping us to, uh, to move forward, and what are those hindrances, what are those super factors which, which we are really struggling with. So that also helps us to identify. So that actually helps us to uh, do certain changes, dramatic changes. For example, Malawi introduced some um, new tools around gender-based violence because they, they, they realize that this is what is one of the areas of concern. And we also had uh, Malawi and uh, Ghana, for example. They introduced personal participatory uh, performance tracker tool, which is a tool for a staff self-reflection. So uh, we realized that staff are uh, you know, teaching, uh, talking about a lot of positive changes, but may not be uh, uh, practicing that themselves. So we introduced uh, some of these tools. These are some of the reflections. We, we thought these, uh, you know, going through that process, sitting with the community, identifying those, and, and also monitoring those, helped us to identify those baby steps, which are, uh, you know, where we are having progress, and that helps uh, our staff to get more motivated, and, and also help us to uh, do some programmatic changes. We are still playing with this tool, and uh, still to learn more as we go along. Thank you.